video game, the 21st century's staple stocking filler, now as common as coal or clementines. A lot recently has been made of these clumsily wrapped packages as legitimate art forms, and um, from that debate two main narratives emerge. One, characterised by sci-fi writing Guardian columnist Damien Walter, suggests that whilst gaming might be fun, it can never put forth ideas as clever and nuanced as the written word. Meanwhile, the other side is characterised by autumn blockbuster Beyond Two Souls. The game stars Juno and Jesus, and as more big-time Hollywood types drift towards the game industry, as hyper-real HD graphics mean their mugs become more recognisable to the joystick-twiddling masses, Willem Dafoe himself has claimed video games are subsequently becoming the future for telling stories. Now, it might surprise you to know that I actually disagree with both of them. To find out why, let's take a look at this embarrassing blue stool of a pixel grouping for a second. In game, he's not much to look at compared to Willem Dafoe, and sure, I renamed him Dickhead when the chance was presented. But when I found out that he was a clone, one with a very short lifespan, I found it more moving than the last Tom Clancy novel and Speed 2 combined. So in what sane universe would we insist that films and books have had monopoly over deep reflective storytelling for the past 20 years? I was able to use this glorified living Parker jacket as a surrogate for my fears and emotions. So video games, like any other art form, have the ability to make us suspend our disbelief. And with that comes the power to either reinforce or challenge natural assumptions and common sense beliefs of our society, our world. Games might, in the history of mankind, have been about very briefly, but for people of a certain generation, it's almost impossible to think of life without them. For any viewers out there over the age of 50, imagine trying to live your life without being able to listen to The Arches on the wireless. But despite this huge importance to so many people, it's impossible to talk about games in any kind of political sense without being derided as some kind of pop culture clown. I mean, talking about films gets you sneered at, but the moment it emerges that you're analysing Call of Duty, people look at you like you've gone mad. It's as if you're analysing Animal Crossing in the style of... Clever idiot. You see, it is because you arrive in this archetypal ideological dream town, you see, which has fallen into disrepair thanks to, you know, lack of industry, not enough investment, and uh, so on and so on, and, you know, the bottom of the map, they don't look a filthy petty bourgeois raccoon. Uh, they both extort you to repair the village, uh, uh, bring the tourists back and so profitability, you know, returns. What do you get from this? You get nothing. And in the face of this exploitation in its purest form, what does this game allow you to do? Okay, you can you can bury the rubbish in your neighbor's garden. You can uh, you can cut down trees. So what? This is you know dusting the balls when you should be amputating the ones for those in power. Uh, 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 you know, uh, so many people. This game they have placed it. Uh, they've claimed it's beautiful for its uh, its peaceful demeanor. No, uh, my God, this is the face of violence. This game, I would say, is more degenerate than uh, the rapist and the pimps in Grand Theft Auto uh, uh, because it teaches us passivity in the face of exploitation and injustice. But of course, you don't need to be a lispy Slovenian philosopher to see video games are awash with ideology, both conscious and unconscious. From the lecture on Hegelian dialectics from Fallout New Vegas' Kaiser, to the subordinate and objectified role of women in Super Mario, Zelda, Metal Gear Solid, Devil May Cry, Tomb Raider, GTA... Digital entertainment is littered with assertions and assumptions that normalise the way modern life functions. Look at two of the biggest franchises of the last 20 years, Resident Evil and Call of Duty. 
both have nigh on Stone Age attitudes to race and cultural relations, both focus almost exclusively on Herculean Caucasians, ubermenching their way through hordes of gibbering heathens, primitive rustics, and of course, tourists. There's a received conservative wisdom at the heart of this digital interpretation of international relations, though. Because not only is this about playing on the fears of a thuggish other hating on Western freedom, it is coupled with a warning of the enemy within. Someone weak enough to try understanding evildoers rather than making the hard decision to preemptively bomb shepherds and wedding parties will inevitably bring about the collapse of civilization as we know it. This can either be embodied by an AI character or the player themselves and their conscience. This is one of the dialogues central to the war on terror, of course. And it's so integral to both series that it's a little surprising there hasn't been a franchise merger where Resi 4's merchant tries to flog bootleg uranium to Captain Price. Have you got any white phosphorus? No, I've got some white spirit. I need something that can burn skin. I'll give you a Chinese burn. Mm. How many kids can I kill with oh, that? fuck's sake, Price. Would you hurry up? I've got a meeting with the Crown Prince of Bahrain at three. And if that happened, that would be fine. Because it's just fiction. So we shouldn't bother reading too much into it, because when has fiction ever hurt anyone? Of course, as I mentioned earlier, because of the emotional pull games have, allowing us to suspend our disbelief, they come with the power to challenge dominant attitudes on race and nation, as well as reinforce them. The ascent of the ever-popular sandbox game, thanks primarily but not exclusively to the success of GTA, has given rise to a wealth of socially conscious digital satires of modern life. From the grimy streets of Liberty City to the thriving futuristic metropolis of Mass Effect, players can go where they will, see what they please, and do as they want, carving out what kind of a world and what kind of a person their character is, in a way that no other form of fiction quite can. But with this new freedom comes a new level of power, to construct a living, breathing fiction developers give gamers control of their own destinies, like they have in real life. This gives the digital representations created an added legitimacy in the eyes of the gamer, and makes ideological assumptions within them all the more potent. So the Titanic Rockstar's Red Dead series and Bethesda's epic Elder Scrolls anthology illustrate this perfectly. Red Dead is essentially Rockstar's test lab for GTA. The latest game, Redemption, was used to pilot many in-game features now found in GTA V. So, for a raw, unpolished look at the ideology in their games, New Austin is definitely the place to go. You play as John Marsden, a former outlaw tracking down his old gang in order to move on with his life and settle down with his family, who are being held hostage by government agents. Along the way, you meet the usual assortment of sociopaths, including snake oil selling businessmen, bigoted cannibals, and government officials. And whilst you are free to roam the past however you see fit, everything is tied together by a coherent critique of modern society. Through your contrasting interactions between ordinary people struggling for survival in the West, and those with the two-faced bureau agent Edgar Ross, you come to see the contradictions of free market ideology. Whilst America might have been sold on the dream of individual liberty, ultimately those in power have no concern for the plight of millions of individuals and the lives that they destroy in their quest for dominance. Particularly intriguing is the way the game's mechanics reinforce this critique of the American dream. You are free to roam as Marston until your job is done, but ultimately your fate lies out of your hands because of your social economic status. Of course, Redemption isn't purely a critique of ideology. In some aspects, it's also a reproduction. For over a hundred years of Hollywood, one group more than any other has been excluded from the Western genre. Centuries of oppression have been airbrushed out of history. And despite criticising the mistreatment of other groups in the game at that time, and being set in Texas when a new set of laws were created just to make those people third-class citizens, the game doesn't so much as hint at this injustice. This can be summed up in one question. 
we're in the tarnation of all the black folk! Whilst Red Dead Redemption puts in a lot of good work satirising society, it also ends up further naturalising the cultural blanket regarding segregation in westerns, whitewashing one of the most problematic aspects of the genre. With this conservative hangover regarding race relations in mind, Trust me, honey, it just ain't worth it. Let's contrast the hyper-realism of Red Dead with quite a different approach, the world of fantasy. Bethesda might have crafted a fantastical world of magic and monsters in Elder Scrolls, but the games still reflect and comment upon many aspects of modern life. The series build on and flip popular Tolkien-esque mythology, which reflects society's dominant ideas about race and nation pretty overtly. By putting their own twist on preconceptions of how fantasy societies function, the games challenge those ideological assumptions about reality and the natural way society is supposedly divided along lines of civilization and race. Take Morrowind, for example. There are no conceptions of evil races in the natural world. You can play as any of the races and play them however you see fit. So you can be an elf, previously regarded rather sinisterly in fantasy as purity itself, the perfect race, and you can be a total bastard and you can kill and pillage your way across the world if you fancy, or you could be an orc, previously regarded as disgusting mutations, the antithesis of the elf, capable only of reckless hatred and thoughtless violence, and you can be the hero. Meanwhile, you play in a society where you know everyone is essentially equal, capable of good and bad, and yet there is colossal inequality. The reptilian Argonians and the feline Khajiit are capable of holding the same emotions, beliefs, skills and aspirations as anyone in the game, and yet many are slaves owned by dark elves known as Dunman. <laughs> Perhaps as important as laying bare the inhumane nature of this relationship, though, is the fact that the series goes into some effort to show that none of these races are in any way genetically preordained to suffer or to conquer. In the most recent game, for example, Skyrim, the Dumma no longer hold slaves, and thanks to the threats of natural disaster and imperialism, many become racially abused refugees, who players will undoubtedly sympathise with. And that's the most important thing. Whilst the games feature characters with bigoted opinions about every race there is, your interactions with those races contradict and disprove those ideas, giving a powerful defence of multicultural society, of all kinds of people being able to live together. It's a complete ideological reverse on the Stone Age politics of Resident Evil, Call of Duty, and a necessary addition to Red Dead if Rockstar wished to create more cutting satires in future. Now, this technique of challenging mythology in order to challenge common misconceptions is further taken on by the final game I'm going to mention. The Wolf Among Us, from the makers of The Walking Dead, is a long, long way from the sandbox gaming I have been talking about. However, it takes elements from both Rockstar and Bethesda in its creation of a digital world. The grimy pessimism and grim critique of the American dream are very much present and heightened by integrating myth and legend into that environment. He plays Bigby, the big bad wolf, in charge of keeping order amongst the fables, creatures of fantasy forced to flee their homelands to make up an immigrant community. The question of culture and ethnicity intersects brilliantly with the grim day-to-day -day struggle for survival that is working class life. The characters who we knew in folklore to be vibrant and thrilling have been ground down by the pressures of fitting in and paying the rent at the same time, whilst the lines between good and bad have noticeably blurred. The wolf has resolved to reform. He now protects the couch-surfing alcoholic pig he once tried to eat, whilst the huntsman who once saved Red Riding Hood from the wolf has become a prostitute-beating drunk. What does all this tell us about reality, then? That there are no predetermined heroes or villains, and that everyone in our society, born to whichever creed or colour, has the potential to be brilliant, brave and beautiful. But also that we live in an economic and political system which has the potential to corrupt, mutilate and destroy any one of us. What's important then is not to focus on individuals or select groups and to blame some demonic other 
Call of Duty style for all of society's ills, but to see past our perceived differences and better our world together. So, the next time somebody insists video games aren't as insightful as fictional mediums like novels or films, or that the industry needs some kind of big bucks Hollywood facelift before they can, you tell them. Get real. Oh, come on, was the pun that bad? That was my drink. Was for the power. Merry fucking Christmas. Video it's you, it's you, it's all for you. Everything I do, I tell you.